Okay, Matthew 26, 36. While you're turning there, I'm going to go ahead and pray. Lord, I do ask you to help us understand this idea, help us recognize that relationships in life, um, unfortunately, a lot of conflicts, and if people understand this truth, that they might uh, recognize and uh, relax and accept uh, your plan. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Matthew 26, verse 36. Uh, the storyline here is this is the night before the crucifixion. Uh, some people that read this think that Jesus was emotional, that he was doubting what was going to happen, that he was concerned, he was uh, distraught. Uh, but that's not the truth. That's not it at all. Okay, He, he does have a, a thought or a question in the process, but uh, he... According to Isaiah chapter 50, Jesus Christ set his face like a flint to go to Calvary. So he wasn't concerned about the suffering, the mob, death. That was not his concern at all. He set his face like a flint. He, I mean, he was determined to go through with that. And there's an issue going on here. In verse 36, Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane. Okay, that's commonly called the Garden of Gethsemane. If you go to the old city of Jerusalem, it's got walls around it. You can walk around about an hour and a half. If you go east of it, there's a little valley, there's a cemetery, and then there's a mountain called the Mount of Olives. And right there is the Garden of Gethsemane. It's still there today. There are olive trees that are about 2,000 years old in this little garden area. Okay, so that's where Jesus Christ liked to go to pray. You can look west and look at the city, okay, and overlook everything, and it's a place of solitude. So that's where he was at. It's about a 10-minute walk from Jerusalem. And his disciples were with him. And he says, uh, sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, so that's James and John, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then saith he unto them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. Tear ye here and watch with me. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my Father. Okay, that's how he always addressed uh, the Father in heaven. God, the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. He always addressed him, Father. But there's going to be one time where he doesn't, and that's the next day. So he says, Oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. So there's a possible contrast of wills here. Okay, and he said, and he cometh unto the disciples and findeth them asleep, and saith unto Peter, What could ye not watch with me an hour? Watch and pray that ye enter not in temptation. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. And he went again the second time and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if this cup may not pass away from me, you can see he's kind of backing down from it, except I drink it, thy will be done. And he came and found him asleep again, for their eyes were heavy, and he left them. And went again and prayed the third time, uh, saying the same words. Okay, and then next two verses he said, okay, I'm going to be betrayed here. So there's a couple ideas I want to kind of bring out in this passage. There's the big, big, huge, major historical transaction taking place here. The news media is not going to tell you about it. This is a big deal, okay? And then there's an underlying idea that will help us understand relationships with others. Okay, and it kind of, if you get this understanding and recognize the understanding, then you could deal with relationship with others in a different setting or a different attitude, I guess you could say. Okay, you can see the issue at hand is a word cup. Take this cup away from me. What is that? Okay, and it's, I'm not going to take the time to go through all the references, but uh, one time cup refers to death, one time cup refers to salvation, and eight to ten times it refers to something else. And that's what he's talking about. What God has in heaven uh, for a nation, he has like a vial or a bowl or a cup, and the sins of that nation are liquefied and placed in that cup. And when that cup gets to the brim... Okay, then that's a time for God judging the entire nation, so he will pick up that cup with his omnipotent hand and pour it out on the people, and that's the cup of God's wrath. Okay, that's what he's talking about. Uh, and uh, the cup of God's wrath, if you liquefy it, would be represented by blood. Okay, so that's like the represent. That's why 
a bloody, he's a bloody person, you know, and so forth. Okay, and that's why we sang about the blood of Jesus Christ, which is kind of probably weird to people that don't understand that. Sing, these weird people sing about blood. Okay, but that's life. City folk don't know that. You know, they, they never cut a head off a chicken. Everybody needs to do that. Lefty, loosey, righty, tidy. So, and that's how that works. It's really easy to do. Okay, but that's life. It's full of blood. Okay, now what's the transaction going on here? Okay, he's talking about the next day, the wrath of God Almighty is going to be poured on Jesus Christ for taking all the sins of mankind. Okay, and it's going to be the only time in the Bible you refine the record where Jesus Christ addresses the Father, my God. My God, my God. Why hast thou forsaken me? My God, God the Father, my God, God the Holy Ghost, why hast thou forsaken me? The only time of a party, that's what he was concerned about. Because Jesus Christ died on Calvary first and foremost for God. Not for his sins, but because God is holy, God is just, he's the creator, he can make the rules. Okay, whoever invents a game, the inventor of the game creates the rules. And if people don't like it, don't play the game. So God has set up these rules where God is, number one, holy. God is, number two, just. And number three, he's love. So God's justice had to be satisfied in order for that to take place. Jesus Christ, who knew no sin, had to become sin to satisfy God's holiness and his justice. And if a man accepts that, then he steps into God's love. There are five books in the Bible that are focused primarily on Jesus Christ. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those first four in the Gospels basically focus on the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ okay, as a sacrificial servant and a savior of mankind. When a man rejects that offer, the fifth book is the last book in the Bible. It's called The Revelation of Jesus Christ, and he's going to see his anger. The first four deals with his love, and if a man rejects that love, they will see his hatred. That's just the, how the game plays. Now, in, in this thing, that's what he was concerned about. He was concerned about the broken fellowship, first time ever known to man, that there was broken fellowship between the Father and the Son. Worse than the split of an atom. Okay, that's how big that transaction was. So the, how did that take place? If you would look in Philippians chapter 2. Jesus Christ voluntarily subjected himself to that. God the Father did not force Jesus Christ to do this. This is part of his plan and God the Son, Jesus Christ, voluntarily accepted that calling. Philippians 2, verse 5. He says, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. What kind of a mind? Verse 3, lowliness of mind. Verse 6. Who, being in the form of God, <clears throat> thought it not robbery to be equal with God. There's a contrast there. <clears throat> Who made himself of no reputation. Okay? You ever hear anybody say, Man, what are you, born in a barn? Uh, no, I wasn't, but Jesus Christ was. Born in a manger. That's where that phrase comes from. Jesus Christ did not have formal education. Homeschooled by his mother. Taught by his father. His father was not a banker, was not a lawyer, was not a scientist, was not this. He was a carpenter. Worked with his hands. Okay, and so no reputation, it says took upon him the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of man, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient, unobedient unto death, even the death of the cross. That obedience was revealed in the Garden of Gethsemane. Okay, why did he do that? He did that because God's holiness and justice needs to be satisfied. And how you know that somebody has been revealed truth by God is when they believe in a justice. If This is where all evolutionists are uh, hypocritical. Okay, 
If you steal money from an evolutionist, he will want you to give it back. And if you don't, he will call the authorities and get you arrested. Well, the dirty dog, they, when my dog steals food from my neighbor's dog, <laughs> the Jeffers don't call me and say, your dog stole from us. Thank the Lord. <laughs> and vice versa. There's no justice in nature, none whatsoever. Okay, if you saw a dead coon on the side of the road coming in, you'd probably say, well, dead coon. If you saw a dead person on the side of the road, I would dare say you may stop, you may call the authorities because there's something different, unique about men. Okay, and so the Lord Jesus Christ has offered, he's offered to man his great sacrifice. Now, Hollywood tries to uh, copy these things, counterfeit these things. People sit there and watch it and all so forth. They don't recognize that is portraying Jesus Christ. Okay, now, Jesus Christ, okay, when you say the Godhead, commonly called the Trinity, it's always laid out, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. It's always put in that category. Why? There is a hierarchy. Okay, so this is the second thought we're going to get from this. Jesus is saying, not my will, but thine be done. Now, some people take that to extreme, that they think God exists just to make your life miserable. <laughs> you know, that's what they think. Now, God exists as a loving Father, and He wants the best for you. But there's sometimes, as a parent, you know what's best for your child, and they don't know. You know, giving them that sugar candy, especially, you know, 9 o'clock at night, is not a smart thing to do. You know, it's like... Uh, what Jay and Ash do when their kids get all this candy, he says, now, I'm going to let you make the decision. You can eat all that right now if you want, or you can ration it out. And so when they eat it all, they get, and then they get sick as a dog. He said, now, I told you, you could do what you want. Suffer the consequences. Okay, so there is a hierarchy. So the first thought is this. Jesus Christ humbled himself to be the Savior of man. When a person doesn't accept that offer what Jesus Christ has done, then they'll face Jesus Christ in his wrath. Now, a person can honor Jesus Christ by accepting that offer. It's a great honor, okay, that a person would accept that offer. You can honor Jesus Christ by doing it. That would be the highest reason to accept him, to honor that, because I am unworthy. Okay, I know I'm a sinner, and so I know that when I heard about Jesus Christ, I said, now that's a good deal. So it is wise to accept that. Or a person has to suffer the same things in their own accord, and then that goes on forever. And that's not a good idea. But still, the second thought is that there is a hierarchy. Okay, God establishes these hierarchies. Okay, so you have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. And God the Son, when he lived on earth, he honored the Father voluntarily. Now, God the Holy Ghost is the one that has most of the ministry now. According to John chapter 14, who does he honor? He honors the Son. That's the hierarchy. That's how you know the charismatic movement's off. Because their Holy Ghost honors their gifts. No, John 14 says that the Holy Ghost bears witness of Jesus Christ. So that's the hierarchy. But yet, Philippians 2 says they're equal. So how do you have a hierarchy, but yet they're equal? That's the same time. In John 5, verse 18, the reason why the Jews are going to kill Jesus Christ is because he said he maketh himself equal with God. John 10, 30, Jesus Christ said, I and my Father are one. But there's a hierarchy. But they're equal. So where's that contrast? And this is where all the fights in life come. A hierarchy is usually on the right side, or if you want to call it conservative side, where they're always promoting the hierarchy. And on the left side, they're always promoting, oh, we're equal, we're all equal, we're equal. Men are like women, men are like women. No, they're not. There's a hierarchy. But there's an equality. And so the fight is between those two. And abuse of this side causes a conflict, and abuse of this side causes a conflict. So a person needs to understand there's a hierarchy in life. In the creative world, it's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. Yet they're equal. 
And then he says in 1 Corinthians that God is the head of Christ. Christ is the head of man. Man is the head of woman. Now, a guy is insecure. He's going to say, see, see, see. He's going to abuse the hierarchy. What's going to happen? Then they're going to fight. And then he and her together are one head of the children. Now, what did Jesus Christ do when he was in the children category? And you see, this is how you got to look and observe people and you understand relationships. For example, in the church setting, I, in the hierarchy, am a pastor, my wife's a member. Okay, in our house, I, the husband, and my wife is here. In the play, she is absolute. Director, writer, composer, she makes the rules, and I am, and I understand that. I voluntarily subject myself, why? Because that's the only way to make it run right. You humble yourself and accept that. Okay, when I go to the farm, it's my dad, my brother, and me. It's always going to be that way. I can never move up in the ranks. So I quit. <laughs> now my nephew gets in there. <laughs> okay, and so, but we, in the church, it's I, my dad, okay, in that order. So when I go to farm, I don't want him to call me pastor. He calls me Dave or stupid or whatever he needs to call me. That's the hierarchy. Okay, and when my brother would tell me things to do, I would do what he said. That's the hierarchy. Okay, so I understand it, but yet we're equal. When, you see, this is the problem with parents. When you get an adult children, you're equal. Stop the advice, unsought advice. You're equal. You see, and that's where you get to understand. And when there's a struggle between the hierarchy, it, it's like this in nature. Pecking order. Evolutionists don't get away from it. There's a pecking order. Okay, there's an alpha dog. You see, uh, there's a study recently where they put two rats together. Big rat, little rat. Big rat subjected little rat. But yet, little rat wanted to play. Big rat wanted to play. But if big rat beats little rat all the time, there's no more play. So they watched this, and this rat's developed 70% of the time, big rat wins, 30% little rat would seem to win. Big rat let little rat win. Why? Because it's done play. That's why I teach young fellas, I'm not going to beat you every single game of basketball. I'll let you win a few. <laughs> big rat, little rat. <laughs> you see? And so, there is a hierarchy. You understand that, but there's an equality. You tell a man who's insecure, I'm the head of the wife. Yeah, but she's equal with you. No, she's not. Yeah, she is. She's the man Christ Jesus inside her body. You see? Oh, he's going he's gonna to make her take uh, Ephesians 5.22 and cram that down her throat. No, you take your time with Ephesians 5.35, husbands love your wives, and you let her worry about that other part. And if you do your part, she's more likely to do hers. But there's times they don't want. Okay? But I'm just saying there's a hierarchy. And I kind of find it funny. You see the hell's angels, you know, the hell's angels, you get their gang out there, you know, we're not going to listen to hierarchy. And they come to a stoplight and they stop. There's a hierarchy. If somebody says there's not, run a red light. Okay? Hopefully, not when I'm around, and hopefully you run a red light when this 18 wheeler's coming through and you're on your bike, so you're a bug on the grill. You're not going to hurt anybody. Okay? There's a hierarchy in life. You're not going to get away from it. Okay? Boss in the job. Owner in the job. Foreman on the job. There's a hierarchy. In the home, there's a hierarchy. Okay? But yet, each are equal. There's an equality there. And the struggle always ensues between when there's an abusive hierarchy... What is the one that equal to that hierarchy, but under that, what do they do? That's where the struggles always ensue. Okay? And when there's contention, Proverbs 13.10 says, Only by pride cometh contention. One of the two parties has pride. Now, anybody that watches sports, especially team sports, knows that if you have two alpha dogs on a team, and one of them doesn't, subject himself to the chemistry of the team, 
they're not going to succeed. They're going to have fighting in the locker room. It's going to continually fight in the locker room because you got two alpha dogs trying to be top dog. Okay, when you get into the religious realm, several years ago, Mr. Pope over there, Pope Johnny Paul II or whatever, he was trying to get unite the churches together, uniting the churches. But then he writes this statement, but I cannot compromise papal authority. What's he saying? What's the dude saying? He's saying, I'm alpha dog. That's what he's saying. And I'm saying, go bark someplace else, pal. You see, there's a hierarchy. And so when we understand this in life, okay, when we understand this, then we could understand our relationships. And if we accept the position God has placed us in, like Jesus Christ, the God-man, said, not my will, but thine be done. Any good coach knows there's times that you need to get your players to do certain things that they won't like to do, but it's for their good. Okay, so we do understand this idea. There's a proper chemistry in teamwork. There's a proper chemistry to make a home have peace. God has called us unto peace. When there's fighting in a home, it's not good for anybody. Now, there's a pecking order, okay? We know that. Chickens do that. Dogs do that. Cats do that. That's just a natural thing of life. All animals have a pecking order. That's a hierarchy. Gentiles, Jesus Christ warned about this. He said, now Gentiles are going to lord it over you. So that's a common, that's our people. Anybody that's not a Jew, Gentile, what they're going to do is they're going to lord it. That's a common tendency and so they're going to abuse the hierarchy. That's the tendency of Gentiles. And Jesus Christ says, I got something better. There's a better method. A better method than that is you serve. You serve. The servant of all is greatest of all. So you work beside. Man, when I was 13 years old, started detasseling corn. Anybody detassel corn? Now that's a job. Detasseling corn. Milking cow upside down. Okay, so you're going to each corn, pulling out the tassel. 13 years old, I am a whopping 4 feet, 10 inches tall. I'm a short peewee. Because I was raised on a farm, and it's not so hard to pull a tassel off, I was made foreman. So here I'm a foreman all over to these kids. They couldn't tell a corn from a bean. And I worked right beside them. I would help them. When it was on their time, I'd be helping them, and then I'd go to the next guy and helping him, and I'd get them to do their job because I was serving them, but yet I was having to lead them, but not in an abusive manner, not manipulating, not abusing them, not yelling at them. You see? And that's, that's the way that, Je that Jesus Christ said is the way a leader does it, different than Gentiles. Now, we all experience Gentile method, right? Abusive boss, he's loud mouth, big mouth. He's going to boss you around, he's going to bully you, he's going to manipulate you. That's how government policy works. Law in force. They're going to force it on you. You don't get to vote about a lot of these things. It's forced on you. That's a hierarchy. Okay, and so what does a person do with it? Now, what a person can do and learn from it is that you can honor God when you accept or are content with your circumstances and positions in life. Okay, now, I'm not saying you're going to have to uh, continually be abused at it, but you can honor God by accepting it volunteer as a child. Accept being a child. Don't get in a big hurry to leave mom and dad, especially if you got a good parents, but yet I know that there's abusive relationships. I knew a lady one time, she had an abusive uh, stepfather, and when he died, she told me, the only regret I have, I couldn't dance in his grave. I didn't judge her about that because, man, I knew what he had done to her. Pretty bad stuff. And I'm not going to say, oh, you're supposed to forgive. Not when I've been, not been there. I mean, my wife and I both appreciate the great upbringing we had. Both of us, just unbelievable upbringing. Okay, but not everybody has that. Now, 
after the Son, Jesus Christ, honored the Father by yielding to his will, in Philippians chapter 2, I'm still there, I don't know if you are, but he says, Wherefore God also hath ex highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven, things in earth, things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. When Jesus Christ accepted his role in the hierarchy, God turns around and honors him. So when we are in a position to understand our hierarchies, and accept our role, we turn around and honor God by doing that. Paul said in Philippians 4, verse 11, In whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Now, he wrote that when he's sitting in a Roman jail. In a Roman jail. Now, he was a single man, so he had a little bit of advantage over a married man. And so in a Roman jail, he said, I'm Content. He even said, I'm the prisoner of Jesus Christ. No, you're confused. You're a prisoner of Rome. He said, yeah, but if it wasn't for Jesus Christ, he wouldn't allow Rome to do this. So I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ. He was content. That's strange. And then he said another thing that we Americans despise. First Timothy 6, verse 10, it says, if you have food and raiment, therewith be content. He had to be nuts. Had to be nuts. What about a house? Paul said, food and raiment, be content. Man, if I was a Greek friar, I would change that for certain. <laughs> but what he's telling us, we need to be content with our position in life. Now, I'm not saying that if a person is in an abusive relationship, just sit there like a, you know, a little lamb and say, oh, I'm going to take it, I'm going to be content. I'm not saying there's times you leave a situation. Okay, now, the Lord Jesus Christ, Luke chapter 2, verse 51, if you want to look at it, he is the creator of the universe. He has become man. He is now a 12-year-old child, and it says he subjected himself to Mary and Joseph. Why? To honor God. Why? To tell us, as children, you subject yourself to your parents. Well, what you do if they're at some abusive situation? Now we got a different situation. Okay, I am not saying that a person is just to continually take abuse. If you got a, a narcissist as a foreman or an owner of a, bo a company, I'm not saying stay in the company. There's times you got to stand your ground. Why? Because you're equal. There is a chain of command, but you're equal. You're not helping a narcissist to get away with what they're doing. When you can set the record straight. Okay? So, what I am saying is that we need to accept our position in life. Okay? And when we do that, we can honor God. Okay? So, if a person uh, has opportunities, accept the opportunity. Can you imagine in, a, in America? You got white privilege. Idiot. In this day and age... Everybody's got opportunities. People that say, oh, I don't have the opportunity. you got your head sticking in a hole in the ground. I mean, the opportunities that are out there in our culture in this day and age are limitless. If a person's got some drive and some initiative, oh, come on. This society where people are walking around like this, if you could show up on your job on time and do what you're told, you will never want a job because most people can't do that these days. Okay, but the thing is, is we can accept, okay, accept your appearance. Do you feel you're too tall? Tough apples, accept it. Too short? Short man mentality? That's how God made you. Accept it. And honor God. I was... Visiting a guy in jail and his kid's sitting on his top bunk and he's telling him about his big and bad, I'm big and bad, and I did this and I did this. He's, he, he's a big bad dude. And then he jumped off to thinking, I'm short man mentality in his head. He needs to accept that. Okay? Are you thin? Are you big boned? Are you big? Accept it. Now, I'm not saying you have to accept it. You can change some things. 
I'm not saying cosmetic surgery, you know, change your face, go from male to female, female to male. You're not changing your DNA. Caitlin is still Bruce. I don't care what he does. It does. Confused people. Can't figure it out? I want to make a big bill. I want to make a big sign. I need to get this done. At the top, ever learning and never able to come to knowledge of the truth. 2 Timothy chapter 2. And on one side, you don't know where you came from. Have a monkey and a man. You don't know who you are. Male, female. You don't know where you're going. And that's the world. They don't. Okay? And they're so confused. And the reason why is they don't recognize there is a hierarchy. So we need to accept if your upbringing was bad, I mean, if it was really bad, God allowed that. If you can accept it, learn from it, you can help people that I can't help. Okay? And I'm, now, if you can change some things, change them. If you can't change them, then accept it. And try to live peaceably with people, but Romans 12 says, if it be possible, live peaceably with all men. Okay, so let's say it's in a job setting where you've got a narcissist over you, and you've stood your ground, you recognize there's a hierarchy, but this person is abusing, that's when you stand up because you're equal. You're equal. And if that person isn't going to comply, leave. That's so funny. When I was in high school, 10th grade, sophomore year, we had a coach that he thought he was real big and bad. And my buddy, he was, uh, man, we goofed off so much. And one time the coach threw this thing out there, if you don't like it, just leave. Now, usually people say that. They're just calling your bluff. My friend said, okay, see you later. And he walked right out. <laughs> and I just, <clears throat> you got to admire him. He wasn't going to put up with it. You see? And there's times you do got to walk away from it. Now, you gotta, now, if it's a situation where it's tough, say, husband and wife, abuse going on, got kids involved, boy, the lesser of two evils steps in. And a person has to get along with their God and try to figure out, what do I do? <sighs> I've tried everything. I'm not sure where to go on this, God. What do you want me to do? And you're trying to yield to God. You're trying to yield to that hierarchy. But yet God says we're equal. And you're trying to figure out what to do. Uh, what did David do with his abusive tyrant king? He ran away. Became a fugitive. He took off. Okay? That's what David did. What did uh, Moses do? When Moses had that abusive Pharaoh... He took off. You see, I'm not saying a person has to stay within a bad environment. Those two took off. What did Joseph do? Joseph's brother uh, sold him into slavery. He couldn't take off. He stuck. He survived. He survived and then thrived in a setting because he accepted what God had for him. And then later on, his brother said, Joe, you're gonna, you gotta, dad told us you're supposed to forgive us. He said, I already done that. Instead of wallowing in self pity, he said, I accept. And Joseph is a type of Christ probably greater than anybody in the Bible. What did Daniel do? Family is ripped away from his family. Parents probably killed, taken over to Babylon. What did he do? He survived and then thrived. You see, so each situation, however God has for each and every one of us, as a body of people, each of us are equal in God's eyes. But yet, there is a hierarchy. We understand that. So, in a hierarchy setting, even though we're equal in a normal setting, in a hierarchy setting, then I'm going to yield to the hierarchy because that honors God. And when you have people that do that, you have a prosperous environment. And when somebody doesn't accept it, then the fights break out. Back and forth, back and forth. Oh, you're going to let you tell me what to do? Oh, you're, you let other people tell you what to do? Why not this one? You just don't like this one. Well, 
Do you need to deal with it, learn from it, grow in it? Or do you need to just leave? Get out of the situation. That's between that party and God. Now, the Lord God desires us to live in peace. That's what he desires. That's what God wants. God wants two parents, husband and wife, to live in peace, have a secure home so children can grow up in a very secure environment. And that's the ideal position. Okay, but in this day and age with families and people are all just messed up, kids have to grow up so fast, they're so confused. I was sitting down at Rensselaer several years ago, a long time. We, on a Wednesday night, we'd pick up area kids. And one boy's yeah, probably 10 or 11 just sitting next to me. And, and Luke and uh, Linz and Ash were still there. And I'm just sitting there next to him during a singing time. I said, that's my daughter over there. That's Ashley. He said, oh, that's Ashley. What's her last name? Hoffman? And I said, now that one over there, that's Luke. That's my son. He said, oh, what is his last name? And I said, Hoffman? And I said, now there's my youngest daughter. That's Lindsay over there. And he said, what's her last name? I said, Hoffman. <laughs> he had six or seven siblings with different last names. That was life to him. He didn't understand that. You see, in, in his upbringing, when they got mad at each other, they just left. Fighting constantly, fighting back and forth. That's life to these people. And Jesus Christ wants us to show them something better. So we show them something better. We recognize that there is a hierarchy, but yet there's an equality. And that's the constant struggle. The hierarchy in life is God. And he said, I'm holy, I'm just. Jesus Christ said, I'm taking a sacrifice. Why? Because I love the man. I love you, God. I love man. I'm in the middle. I take the sacrifice. Man accepts me, gets in your love. No better deal than that. That's offered as a free gift. No better. No religions of the world does that except for Bible-believing Christianity. That's a unique trait of this book. That's how you know it's different. And that's how you know it's of God. Okay, let's pray. Lord, I do pray you'd help us to kind of grasp this idea, this idea of hierarchy, equality, <clears throat> where as everybody's equal at the foot of the cross, we're all sinners. But when a sinner accepts your payment for their sin, they become a saint in Jesus Christ. But yet in this life, we're dealing with sinners and we got a hierarchy. We got an equality. And Lord, I pray you'd help us to recognize the difference. Help us to yield when we need to yield voluntarily. That's what you tell us in the hierarchy. You yield in the hierarchy. And when we do that, we honor you. And when we honor you, you in return, in the judgment, going to honor the person, people that accept it and are content with it and love you because of it. <clears throat> well, heads about and eyes are closed. If you don't know for certain that you're saved, if you don't know for certain Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is the Savior of all men. But then he throws in a P.S., especially those that believe. In order to access that Savior, you've got to believe in what Jesus Christ did and agree. You are the Savior. I am unworthy. I'm going to accept your offer. An amazing thing is he gives it for eternity. No better deal than that. And then the Spirit of God comes in and he's the interpreter of the Bible. We get to understand the Bible. And as believers, we understand in the home, in sports, in life, in nature, on the job, there's a hierarchy. There is an equality, but there is a hierarchy. And the Lord Jesus Christ demonstrates that he's equal with God, but yet he subjected himself to the will of God. And God turned and honored him. And God would turn and honor those who accept his plan. Well, heads bowed and eyes closed. The piano will play. If you'd like to use the altar, it's available. <clears throat> if you're not certain of salvation... You want to ask somebody about it? Ask them. If you want to come down here, I can have somebody show you. This gives us an understanding of relationships. Where are we at in that? Big brother, little brother. Orientals, uh, they get this a little better than we do in our culture. 
but still there's a hierarchy of life. There's an equality. There's a hierarchy. When a person understands that, then we could cooperate with God's program, God's plan, but the highest of all is God Almighty. Lord, thank you for uh, your word. Thank you for your testimony at the Garden of Gethsemane. Thank you for paying the price. Thank you for offering that offer free. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us to love you more because of it. And help us to recognize that as you subjected yourself to Mary and Joseph as a child, then in our home settings we have a hierarchy. Help us to follow that chain of command. Accept it. Help us to know when we need to get out of a bad relationship and that we might be a blessing and honor to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.